Uh, Alfonso Sumato Chair in Italian and Italian American Studies. Uh, I'm going to uh, say a few words and then I'll, I'll give her a more formal weekly introduction here in a second. Uh, but I want to uh, acknowledge that this chair is made possible through the generous donations of the members of the Brookhaven chapter of, the, of UNICO, National Italian American Service Organization. And I really want to thank uh, the organization and all its members and donors for their generosity. Um, and of course, this chair would not be possible without the hard work and vision of the late Mario Mignola. Um, he invested a great deal into this chair, and we all agreed that he would have wanted us to continue our work. Um, he is missed, but of course, not forgotten. So thank you, Mario, for the um, hard work and vision for this. Uh, there are many people to thank uh, bringing this all together. <laughs> Uh, Joe Fusco, of course, the director of center, and Annette uh, Blasso. Uh, we've been invading this space now several times, uh, and uh, very welcoming and accommodating and generous with the expressos. Uh, <laughs> uh, my fellow search committee members, uh, and by the way, I'm Paul Kelvin, I'm the chair of the search committee, uh, the, the most important person here. Uh, uh, but I want to uh, uh, express my appreciation to the search committee members uh, for all their hard work. Um, the dean's office, um, their hard work, Jenna Costa, uh, Professor Sarah Jourdain, the chair of uh, European Languages, Literature, and Culture, uh, has hosted um, Professor Sarah, and I want to thank her for all her work, and her assistant, Libby Tolson Harris, for working on the arrangements. So, uh, for our featured uh, uh, speaker and our guest, <coughs> Professor Alaria Sarah, she is currently Associate Professor of Italian and Comparative Studies in the Department of Languages, Linguistics, and Comparative Literature at Florida Atlantic University, and soon to be promoted to full professor. I'm giving her a promotion right now. Uh, she received her PhD in 2004 in the program in Comparative Studies, a uh, public and intellectual program at Florida Atlantic University. Um, she has uh, published widely in Italian and Italian American studies. And I can't tell you everything she's done. I would take up all her time for the talk. Uh, but she has published numerous articles on such topics as Italian cinema, Italian American poetry and autobiography, the history of Italian music, Italian immigration, among other many other topics. She has an impressive number of books and edited volumes. And I'll particularly mention two uh, that are in the English language because you wouldn't want me to say them in Italian. Uh, her two monographs, uh, The Value of Worthless Lives, Writing Italian American Immigrant Autobiographies, published by Fordham University Press in 2007, uh, and, that, and it was paperback in 2010. Uh, she has published uh, The Imagined Immigrant, Images of Italian Immigration to the United States between 1890 and 1924. Uh, published by Farley Dickinson, University Press in 2009. Uh, her current project uh, is on two centuries of Italian history, music, and lyrics. It's a very interesting promise. Uh, at Florida Atlantic University, she has served as a valuable faculty member who has excelled in both teaching and service, earning nominations for a Distinguished Mentorship Award, as well as an award in Excellent and in Innovation in Undergraduate Teaching. Uh, she has been active in pursuing grants and other external funding to benefit FAU students and has been an energetic conduit between the Italian American community of South Florida and her home university. So I have asked uh, Professor Sarah to discuss with us today for about 45 minutes the trajectory of her research, how it has furthered the field of Italian and Italian American studies, and where she sees the future of Italian and Italian American studies. Uh, there will be time for questions and answers following the talk. In about 5.15 or so, we will bring the presentation, the question and answering, to an end. Uh, and we will welcome everyone to join us for a reception. So without further ado, I uh, introduce to you Professor Sarah. Uh, do you hear me without the microphone? Very nice presentation. Thank you. <laughs> uh, very well done. 
done. Uh, I want to dedicate this lecture to the memory of Mario Mignone because being here, it's really uh, breathing uh, with him and seeing his work. So I dedicate it to him. I dedicate it to him. So when Professor Kelton asked me to do uh, the trajectory of my research, the first image that came to my mind, if I have to animate it or if I have to see it, it's a leap. It's going from here to there, uh, from one stone to the other of this stony brook that is going to be behind <laughs> me uh, in my presentation. So I called it leaps. Uh, let's see if I can stay here. Um, Okay, so here we're going to, I will uh, explain how I leap from one uh, stone to the other, from one discipline to the other. Uh, because what excites me the most when I do uh, research is finding some unexpected connections or some uh, ties that are not uh, obvious to the, to the, to the eye. Um, and often, when two disciplines touch, there is a sparkle. There is something that's really um, exciting about it. So this is where my research takes me uh, in the choice of the topics. So the first leap, uh, it's actually a five uh, steps leap, uh, brought me to my first books. Uh, this is the Italian version. This is the uh, English version, The Imagined Immigrant that all um, center around the idea of imaginario. Imaginario is between imaginary and ima uh, an imaginary, so a list of images, or something that is not real, it's imaginary, it's in your mind. It's something in between. There are images that uh, actually have such a strength that they become uh, ways to judge the world, or ways to see the world. And uh, the immigrants, when they came here, this is the history of, it, of the immigration uh, during the Great Migration at the turn of the century. The immigrants that came here brought with them an image that never uh, left them and that made them be judged and uh, victims of prejudice uh, very often because they were seen in a way, uh, in a certain way from the, the Americans, the, the people who were here already. So the newly arrived suffer this kind of prejudice. So Imaginario is the production of mental images about a subject, mental images that often find concrete representations. So where do I find the concrete representations? I thought of uh, uh, looking in different places. Uh, autobiographies by the immigrants themselves because they have their own image of their life and after uh, entire life uh, spent struggling, they look back and they give their own interpretation in a way, even defending themselves from the prejudice they have suffered in their, um, in their life. And the letters are a little less filtered um, perspectives on their lives. They are stories that they tell to their parents. So we have uh, the sets that I studied, the two sets of letters have two different Ways. One is very positive, doesn't want to tell anything bad that could worry his mother, and the other one is very negative. So we have the two extremes in these letters. And then the <coughs> interviews, I worked on about 30, micro, uh, 30 interviews done in the 80s by um, uh, Ellis Island, in the Ellis Island Museum, and the microfilms I studied, I found, and um, the memories that they brought of their passage to Addis Island. Cinema, I, I looked for movies in the UCLA Film Archive, and I focused on four movies, short movies by Edison um, and Porter. They were the very first uh, movies that were coming out, and some of them had immigrants, Italian immigrants as uh, protagonists. Uh, some of them very negative, like The Black Hand, uh, that told the story of Mafia, the first uh, uh, Mafia in New York. Um, the Skyscrapers of New York that has uh, a protagonist called uh, Dago Pete. Uh, so <laughs> even said it in the subtitles, in the titles. Um, and the uh, European <coughs> rescuer that sees this uh, American, British American tourist that goes to Italy to get rest and is uh, taken by the brigands in the ruins of Pompeii. Um, and uh, her first adventure that tells the story of a kidnapping by Italians, uh, organ grinders. 
So these images were the images that were going around at that time, and I was very interested in fleshing them out. Um, the Italian by Thomas Ames was a movie in, made in, in 1914 that changed, started to change things. So even if we see that this man's uh, goal is always vendetta and vengeance, he also has this very human and very um, uh, sympathetic side on him. So at the end, he does renounce to the vendetta and, uh, because he remembers his son. And uh, also, I added one more source that was the newspapers, the first decades of uh, the newspapers, the New York Times and the San Francisco Chronicle, because they were two extremes, two extremes of the country, and showed different images, quite negative in the New York Times until the um, uh, first de de second decade of uh, 1900. And the, New York, the San Francisco Chronicle instead more positive. Uh, um, they were, the Italians had already migrated for a long time in uh, California. They have, were uh, integrated a lot more, so they were more picturesque the way they were uh, described. Um, so this was really the memory, how the memory of the immigration, the imaginary of the immigration was, uh, was built. One of the sources that I found in the archival work was very coincidental. It was Carmina Biagio Iannace, and uh, I discovered many years after that he was the uh, grandfather of Mario Mignone, <laughs> who wrote this beautiful autobiography where he says, I cannot live in the States and I came back to Italy. Now that I'm in Italy, I cannot live in Italy anymore and I have to go back to the States. He called himself un uccello fuitizzo, like a bird that has escaped the nest, the, the cage, but wants to go back. They can't live far away from it. So he says, I tormented myself night and day. There had to be a way out. A way out. It could not end like this. To spend the rest of my life hoeing like the others until no longer had any strength left, or to annul all my desire in work, to sleep exhausted until dawn and then begin all over again, no, the very thought gave me the chills and my legs began to tremble. I felt crushed, weak, sick. That's what was consuming me, Abuli. I couldn't stop yawning. I would have died of a broken heart. I had to return to America. So this idea of America is the freedom uh, from toil. And this also took me to the next project. Um, autobiographies were really calling me in a way uh, because of these very powerful images of the immigrants on their own life. And um, the autobiographies that I, w I looked for were not the ones of the people who made it, Frank Capra, Iacocca, uh, but the ones that did not make it or made it in a normal way, in a decent way. And uh, strangely enough, I wrote a lot about their lives. So Giuseppe Prezzolini, one of the Italian intellectuals, came to New York and said, our immigrants have left nothing, only tears. No stories about their lives, no memories. Um, for sure they never wrote their stories. And instead, from unexpected places, I was able to unearth some of these very interesting stories. The first one came knocking at my door because it was uh, uh, an ice cream maker from Sicily, Calogero Di Leo, who came to me and said, I have this book I want to write. Um, and it's a book of my life for my daughters, but it's in Italian and they don't understand Italian and they don't understand my handwriting either. So he asked me to type it and then he had, we also translated it. So it was a big work, but he wanted a book. And all, many of these um, autobiographers uh, wanted a book. So I said, what is it about this book? What do they want? They just wanted to protect their life in a way between two cheap covers, two covers, any uh, nothing fancy, but something that could keep them for the, the future, for their um, sons, sons and daughters. So they are autobiographies from people who don't know how to write sometimes, that write in a very simple way. Um, and for them, I imagine this um, new category to imagine them, the quiet individual, because they are, yes, individual, they had detached from the mass, they had taken this big step of migrating, they had crossed the ocean, but at the same time, they are not flaunting their actions. They are telling their stories sotto voce, like in a quiet voice. One of them even wrote it in pencil, 
those are warm and rotate in pens. I'm not wanting to um, to leave too much of a scratch on the paper. So there are author of narratives about the self told sotto voce rather than shouted in trouble. Rather than the individualism of the fighter, that of the fought. They told about their story, how, how many times they were defeated. Um, they tamed, tamed by life. They are almost accustomed to protect and defend themselves from the blows of fortune that they aim to protect their life between two cheap covers in the book. Um, even when Prezzolini was saying um, Italians, immigration was a mute tragedy. The survivors do not want to remember. At the same time, there was a doctor, you know, Michele Daniele, who was dying on his deathbed, and he was scribbling uh, to his son. And his son couldn't understand what was written. Finally, uh, the son, this is an introduction of his uh, of the biography. He understands that he's writing Il Libro. I want the book, the book of my life. R publish it or write it or read it after I die. And in fact, that was uh, the final gift of this son to his father. He uh, publishes the autobiography of his father. Um, so these are the quiet individuals that I um, described in this book. They seem to be saying, here is my life. I made it through it. Um, I have endured many storms, but I'm still here. I worked hard. I made it well. I'm decent. I didn't make so much, but uh, I did enough. Listen to me, my children, and the few were interested in my small lives. Um, store it as a memory enclosed in this book. Keep it in the shelf, on the shelf of your house. This is what these books uh, seemed uh, to be saying. It was very important even for um, illiterate workers to be uh, living a written sign of their lives. Uh, one was a Sicilian, for example, a miner, uh, Antonio Margariti, who was a factory worker in Philadelphia, who starts his right to write his memory, uh, memoirs as the last uh, surviving member of his family. And he says, I'm only a little grain fallen from the space. And I can only use my cutting web of my cutting tongue and a quick brain to make my story know, uh, known beyond my fence, he says. Uh, because outside my block, nobody knows that I exist. And he writes exist with a capital E. Yeah? So they're also writing, because writing is not familiar to them. Sometimes they play with this uh, graph graphics and give them mm, multiple meanings. And another big example is Pascal D'Angelo that you probably know. And he really w lived his life in the worst possible conditions, flooded by um, the, the toilets of 10 family of the building that he was living in. And he stops working with the people of the Trodacco, that is uh, uh, his uh, gang, and instead wants to start writing. And uh, his motivation is, who hears the studs of the pick and the jingling of the shovel? Who, what is going to be left of me after I just work hard? All my works are lost, lost forever. But if I write a good line, then when the night comes and I cease writing, my work is not lost. My line is still there, and it can be read by you today or anyone else tomorrow. But my pick and shovel work cannot be read either by you today or by anyone else tomorrow. And um, he spends all his life, uh, he dies very young at 38, in poverty. They don't even have to, uh, money to bury him and have his uh, funeral. But he is able to publish uh, Son of Italy, his, uh, his memoir. So these are all first generation uh, immigrants. They seem always more, the most interesting to me because they are the border crossers, the ones that live in two uh, countries, in two dimensions. Uh, again, it's Carmine Piannace that says, I was like living a double life, not two different or opposing lives, but one having double value. And other writers are really interesting. In the 58 autobiography that I was able to find, there is a woman from uh, um, Vicenza that lives in uh, Chicago and says, I am like the Calicantus. The Calicantus is this shrub 
that uh, flourishes in winter in Italy. And I tried planting it in Chicago many times, but I'm like it, like this shrub. Uh, doesn't, I don't grow in Chicago. <laughs> it doesn't grow in Chicago. Uh, and then there is Tuziani and many other people. Uh, very interesting stories that they have to tell, and they, they're all contained in this, uh, the value of worthless lives. Here you can also see the oxymoron, uh, worthless lives, in, not in a disparaging way, just uh, in the eyes of the others, but not for them, for sure. They know how to value them and to give them value, and it's only up to us to recognize it. Uh, so, in a way, I was giving them homage. Um, then, <laughs> Uh, I will go now to other leaps um, and other research that I've been doing the last uh, eight, nine years. Um, this is dedicated to Eugenia Bulat. Um, the leap here, this, the title of, the, um, of my presentation for this book is The City of Venice and the Eugenia Bulat Liquid Poetry. Uh, I edited this collection of poems. Here the leap is even in the poet herself. She is a Moldavian uh, um, worker, a uh, Moldavian immigrant to the city of Venice. And the, one of the images you can find there, the siren, in a way she is hybrid because she was, in Moldavia, she was the first um, democratically elected mayor in her town. She was an activist, she was a journalist. She comes to Venice because of hardships and the situation, the economic situation, and there she becomes a caretaker, a badante, somebody who uh, follows the uh, dying people. So a completely different uh, life, a completely different uh, hybrid, monstrous almost uh, um, creature that she turns into. And uh, she, out of this uh, very clashing situation, uh, three books of poetry come out, and this is the third one that I edited with her. And um, she is able to identify with the city of Venice. So it, my reading in it is how Venice and this poetess become one. That's why it goes under the echo criticism or echo poetry, uh, uh, poetics category. Um, and she says, I need to become like a stone, a stone of Venice. That to uh, harden all my feelings, otherwise I would die of depression. I need to not feel, to become like a stone. And if you see the image over there, this is La Partigiana, mm -hmm. uh, the partisan uh, uh, fighter. It's a um, sculpture by Augusto Mure, and it's in front of the Giardini in Venice. So it's very expressive to see, to show how, what Venice can do to some immigrants when they come there in this very strange situation. <coughs> and then she does find peace, and she almost melts in the, in the waters of the lagoon, where she finds a welcoming placenta, where she says, in the middle of all this hardship, I was able to find poetry again. And that is what saves her. Um, so the blurb at the top tells you exactly what I was saying. Uh, she uses delicate and suffering verses to represent herself as a woman in metamorphosis, turning into a hybrid siren, a statue of stone, and then melting into the waters of the lagoon. Um, another leap here, it's uh, echo, always in the category of echo criticism. I call that, it's when I um, treat poetry and its ties to the environment, when the poetry and the environment become almost one. Um, and Serenella Jovino, Jovino is one of the uh, four, at the forefront critics in eco-criticism. And she says, I don't think you can read on the white on the top, but she says, the environment is not just out there, it is everywhere, outside and inside our bodies and discourses. It is at once a background, an issue, an actor in our social and biological life and in our literature. So um, in this case, the Sardinian, Sardinia as poetry is Sardinia as it become poetry in the um, work of Giovanni Corona. Giovanni Corona is this poet who worked, who lived and worked in um, Santo Lusurgiu, uh, a place, a uh, town that's in the crater of a volcano in Sardinia. And he lived in a house that was very deep. You can see it over there. Uh, I don't know if you see the cursor. Uh, very deep down, so he uh, writes almost uh, hypogeum poetry, uh, very soft, very liquid, very uh, feminine in a way. He 
sees himself as the cork tree. The cork tree is typical of Sardinia. It's these uh, cork trees that are completely um, skinned, alive, to use the cork for bottles. And now it's a, it's a uh, production in crisis. He uh, she sees himself as the water of uh, those of that source, um, uh, the fall that is close by his town. Uh, that tumbles down and gets scratched everywhere because it's a very, very gentle soul. Like his soul is exposed, like that of the tree. Um, he also uses Sardinia as something that uh, plays with him. You can see in the picture on the top, he's uh, portrayed with other friends, and in that picture especially, he, the wind is playing with his um, hair. And in his poems, he uses himself as a passive, almost, object to Sardinia. Mm -hmm. So, a wind knows me, he says. Um, and the basalt in that picture on the, uh, on the house, that's the basalt from the, um, the Ignis rock from the crater. And he uses it. I, this is all my reading. I don't think he ever thought of it, probably. But in a way, that reminds me of this basalt used in decorations in the houses. Um, when he uses bold letters and bold uh, uh, words to emphasize some negative uh, um, subject or noun, pronoun, because usually dedicated to war. He's very pacifist, so when he gets very angry, he uses this bot of uh, black ink. And the last one, it's the work that his family did. His family, he lived among sisters and a mother all his life, and they were wool makers, wool workers, and they did this amazing uh, um, works of um, loom. And uh, some of his poems are constructed in the same way, uh, physically with, that, um, with those drawings, and also in a symbolic uh, way. For example, the one that I treat is dedicated to the, dog, the grandchild of somebody who migrated. So in a way, he's tying the hair ties back to, his, to the ancestors, saying, your eyes have seen with other eyes before you in this town. And um, so it's a heirloom poetry that I would um, <coughs> identify with those um, works of, of, the, of hand cloth. And this was a matter for a presentation that I gave two days ago on Skype with Tallahassee and US USF because I had to come here, so I recorded myself. Uh, another jump, this is, I gave this presentation here last time I was here. Um, the sculptures by Bruno Catalano, these sculptures seem metaphors, they seem poem by themselves. They don't even have to have poems related to them, but it's very easy to find, especially in migration poetry, something that would completely identify with these broken statues. Mm -hmm. And it all started from a game. They were exposed in San Marcos Square in Venice. And I started taking my students there and asked them, so what do you think they mean? And I, I thought I had already my answer. And I received 10 different answers, completely different than mine. And that's the power of art, when it gives so many uh, possibility interpretations. So um, this article uh, came out in Studi Italiani, and it's the title of Italian Voyagers on the Roads of the World, um, and where I, tr I use these sculptures to describe the broken souls of the, uh, the Italian immigrant poets. Um, for example, I just put it two over there, I will read them because I don't think you can read them. Uh, the famous lines by Joseph Tuziani, uh, that I'm sure all Italian Americans here remember. Two languages, two lands, perhaps two souls. Am I a man or two strange halves of one? And that's obviously the big hole, the gaping hole in their, um, in their soul. Um, another poet, Roberto Dobran, uh, titled this, this poem, If and If Say. If I don't perceive the connection, if the beginning I don't see, if it is even there, and the end, and if the place where I walk is called maybe, then I suddenly tremble. So even there, not seeing where you're going, and there's not, not seeing the connection between where you come from and where you're going, and the feeling of, um, of being lost that, that you feel. But also, in the same time, another interpretation is how the landscape becomes these people. 
how where the, the place that they start to live in becomes their body. Because what we don't see is actually made out of the sea behind them. Um, so another dimension of this kind of poetry is how they internalize the landscape they live in. Um, this is the silent poetry of Catalano's culture. Another similar take, um, it came out in the Forum for Modern Language Studies and also at the University of Innsbruck for another publication. And I was so proud of this that I even proposed it for a prize, the Ecocriticism Prize, but I didn't win. But still, it was published in the, in, in the review. Um, and in this uh, research, part of my research, I call it the geography of the abandoned country, where I use the poetry of Italian Americans of second, third generations, the ones that have never been to Italy, but they still inhabit these ruined places. So Italy is full of these uh, destroyed towns, the abandoned towns. There are 6,000 of them. And they are all abandoned for different reasons. But looking, doing a research online in this case, uh, for the images, I thought that I could find images that are symbols and metaphors of those, of the poems uh, of these uh, third generation immigrants. For example, the pulverized steps where uh, immigrants trying to find a way back and they cannot find it. Um, uh, Giuseppe, I think, has, the, has some verses that speak of this Mm, being lost, not finding a way back. Uh, you tell me that I sprang from such a soil too, some centuries ago. If I can pass beyond the perilous passages through that cypress groves, will I regain that place? Will I ever go back to this mythic country that my parents tell me about? Um, or the one on top, The Missing Link. There is a poem by uh, John Chardy who is dedicated to the town of his mother, Manu Calzati in Campania, where he says, I am stopped between the rock and the air, the sea and the rock. The arrest of the action lays forever on the air of the place of the dive, because he doesn't know where to go. He doesn't have the link between the two, his present and his past. So even in that image, we can see that very clearly. Um, and the one on the bottom, that's the Lake of Curon where we only see uh, um, a company, a bell tower, sticking out. And that is really the image of this submerged country, uh, of the grandparents, something that is still there, that they know is there, but they, they cannot see. But still they see the sign, the signpost of it. You, they see the, um, the bell tower sticking out. And for the last image instead, those are his art installations. Uh, maybe some of them you have seen or have been lucky enough to see them in Ellis Island. Uh, in the abandoned hospital of Ellis Island, JR, um, enlarged these great pictures, big pictures of immigrants, immigrants, and put them on walls or on broken windows, giving the idea of the transients of the place and these souls that pass through that, looking for a place to go. Uh, and I used um, the poems by, um, oh, I don't know you're writing, Astoria by, by so John, Robert Viscusi, uh, where he says, I go to, he has an entire book on his island uh, dedicated to these transients. And even the book is made of uh, different segments that you can use and build together. Uh, what it means to be an Italian-American. So I begin by saying the first thing you are is not, because you have no country, no language, and nothing much as such. Magnetism holds in place the empty Italian-American body. My theory says we inherit each a box of broken pieces of the past. So this is another dimension of the Italian-American broken souls, and nothing better than these images really make it clear and visual. Uh, another aspect, this was a contribution to a very good uh, personal effect dedicated to, the, um, to Luis de Salvo, uh, the memorialist and uh, great scholar. Um, and they asked me to speak about On Moving. One of her books is called On Moving, and there she memorializes, she writes uh, her life and the lives of many other writers who have been through the 
uh, disruption of moving, the trauma of moving from one house, one country, one place to the other, and tries to make sense uh, of these moves. So the image that I used to criticize or to describe this book is the Salvos Rialto. Rialto, I could have said Ponte Vecchio, but uh, being from Venice, I used the Rialto Bridge. Um, but this is a unique uh, construction, a unique architecture in Italy. There is no other place where you can live on a bridge. <laughs> so you live on the suspension. You accept it. Uh, you're completely trying to make sense of it and suffering from it. But at the same time, you can also find it as a home for you. And that's what the book does. The book does that in a very... Um, very nice way because she's very, very effective in finding a sense in these apparently nonsensical moves. Um, it's, the bridge dangerously stands on the void, but at the same time provides a shelter, a safety, a temporary home. I use George Simmel and the door and the bridge saying how humans are the only creatures that use doors and bridges that know how to inhabit those spaces, the connection and the separation. Uh, they have to make sense of these in their lives. Um, one more, uh, memory and place. Here instead I was asked to describe the, uh, the youth of a historian. Uh, the, it was uh, a collection of essays on the youth of uh, historians, uh, male and female, storici and storiche. And um, Marius Negi is the professor of contemporary history at the University of Venice. I actually well, I graduated with him, so I thought what better uh, presentation than to present his own youth. And his youth uh, is characterized by the city of Venice. So his um, scholarship is based on the Lieu de la de Memoir by um, Pierre Nora. Uh, Pierre Nora is this French historian who uh, individualized some places uh, that, are, that contain history. Uh, places in cities where history took place, they still cannot uh, release it, they still keep it. Uh, there are usually monuments, places where um, history is written and memorialized. Um, and so, uh, using Le Lieu de la Memoire, which was the, the places of memory, his own scholarship, I went to look for uh, the places of his own memoir, his own life. And uh, the city of Venice is a city that keeps history written on its walls. Everything that happened in Venice, everything that was there, the shop that was there, it's now written on the top of the Misioetto, the white uh, um, sign. Mm -hmm. So there is a reason why every place has a name in Venice. It's never arbitrary. Ponte degli Incurabili, just one because it's famous, the Fundamenta by Brodsky. Um, it's because that was the hospital where the people who could not be cured would, would go, incurabili. Um, here in this other image, um, what sticks out is more the way that Venice builds in layers. So you see the 15th century arches and then the house on top of it. But they didn't cancel the arches, they didn't cancel one part. Venice is very respectful even uh, of its history. And what is the in danger now, not only with the big ships, is this not understanding it anymore. Nobody remembers, nobody knows why these things are there. So it's very, I'm very <laughs> uh, concerned about this part of uh, the loss of identity in Venice. So this is a walk in the places of memory of the influential historian who grew up in a city that keeps the memory on its, of its history on its walls. And other uh, historians, Fernando Del said, uh, my scholarship is informed by, by the fact that I was born uh, in the lower class, in a, a, a faraway part of Lorena. Eric Obsbaum also says, I was born in Alexandria d'Egitto, that's why I have this angled view, perspective on history. Carlo Ginsburg says, I'm a Jewish origin, and that's why I understand, I have the taste for distance and not belonging. So there were other ways that historians actually were influenced by how they were born and where they were born. So this was an attempt to give one more interpretation. 
uh, Memory and Place. This is the, this is the um, publication from the University of Hawaii, and they asked me to for three times, for three years, to give uh, a review of the year, so a review essay in biography of the new releases in biography and autobiography in Italy. So one of the three um, issues speaks about uh, biographies from the Alps to Capri, because coincidentally that year, many uh, biographies came out um, connecting the lives of these people with the places that they lived in. Uh, and at the same time, at the University of Andiari in, uh, in um, Academia della Autobiografia, uh, in Andiari in Tuscany, they had a conference titled I dove della vita, luoghi non luoghi, the where of life. So I centered all this um, reading about um, the where of life uh, of the people who wrote uh, biographies and autobiographies in that year. From Natalia Ginsburg, Louis Trenker in the mountains, uh, Adriana Capocci and uh, Capri, Bobby Baslan and Trieste, Michelangelo and the caves of marble, etc. Um, memory and place, also this one, this is the, uh, an entry from the Encyclopedia de Routledge History of Italian Americans, and I was asked to speak about uh, femininities, mm -hmm. so I wanted to give a review of women and their, uh, women's voices and their femininity, how they wrote about themselves, mm -hmm. because there are many women who say, uh, it took the largest part of 20 years, this is uh, Johanna Klaus Hermann, uh, to be able to fully lose my word hoard against this wordlessness. Um, very hard that women start telling their stories, but when they do, they open doors that have never been opened before. So I, the way I constructed this essay was going through the rooms of their houses and regrouping their autobiographies by theme or by um, maybe the most important of their themes. Uh, on the balcony, for example, the women that speak when they have a, a public uh, role, Geraldine Ferraro, or Bella Bisono Dodds, um, or because they're angry, like Lancelotto, uh, the kitchen, the salvo, the milk of almonds, Gilbert, uh, the bedroom where there are very important secrets revealed, or the relationship with diseases, their stories of disease and mothers, who, or motherhood, or um, Alaya, who was uh, married a priest. So very, very intimate stories. Uh, the study, uh, Diane Di Prima, even Rosa, the first immigrant who told their story, and um, finding the study in the education, the way to go ahead. The workroom, the backyard, beautiful backyards uh, in the stories of women. So this is um, a way to pa that passes through the doors of their homes and explains their uh, autobiographies <laughs> and their lives. Here, um, history and myth. Um, <laughs> this is a very interesting story. I started all with an archival research in the hills of the Apennini between uh, Liguria and, um, and, and Tuscany and uh, on men and bears, a forgotten migration in 19th century Italy. Um, there was a group, an entire uh, town, that, that left in the uh, spring and would go around Europe the whole summer with bears. And they would have these circuses or these small shows with animals. And it, they're completely forgotten. We have some uh, um, letters, but they are even scratched out. If there is something that they wanted to hide, and maybe because they were taking children with them, maybe because they were called them, sometimes they had this, that was a lot of the right way, um, orfanelli portati, they were called portable orphans, uh, when they would buy children to come with them and work for them as slaves in that way. Um, so you would find these um, documents in the um, archive of Genova. I found some of them, they are scratched, scratched out. So, but you still find these pictures, and these pictures have a very uh, special way to show the body and the demeanor of these uh, um, migrants, because especially in that middle one that what became also the cover of the issue, uh, they almost become their alter ego. So there is a book about um, the color black by Pastoreau, French um, cultural historian. 
that links the black and the devil with the bear. So in a way, I was saying that, that these or Santi, these bear trainers, these immigrants, have tamed the beast of migration. They are able to stand up, to look up, to uh, show themselves to the world in a way that's very proud, like the fallen king that was the bear, because it also he was tamed. Uh, by life. So they share the destiny of fallen kings who, want, who try to give themselves some um, strength. This is very recent, uh, just came out. Uh, this is some aesthetics. Street is feminine in Italian. I start from this um, linguistic par paradox that street is feminine, La Strada, but even the movie where La Strada is the title is not very feminist. It uh, kills the woman. It, that the strada has always been a masculine uh, space in Italy. And uh, who uh, noticed them and who denounced them was the first the feminist movement. And so I speak about the feminist movement and their relationship to the streets, to the city, from the parade, the fascist parade, where women were paraded, but that was the only time they were allowed to really uh, take the center of the street. And when the, account, the, the journalists were writing <coughs> about them was saying um, that was a very strange um, experience between a catwalk uh, and a military parade. They couldn't express it. How do this mother or women can parade like that in the middle of the street? And that was the only moment that they were taken back to their sidewalks. Uh, but during f um, feminism, that's also a very important picture, as you probably know. Uh, the American in, in Florence, mm -hmm. in front of the Cafe Gilly, mm -hmm. Gilly, mm -hmm. uh, where she is. Uh, Ruth Orkin, that t took that picture in '54, said that was not negative at all, the way she saw it. She saw it as a woman enjoying her walk. Oh, oh come on. <laughs> okay, you don't see it, but one of them is actually touching himself there. And it's, it's not usually noticed, but it's one of the ways that women could be harassed. And feminists completely denounced that, saying in, in uh, um, images like that one, our uh, men are outside uh, uh, protesting, and we are here making photocopies for them inside the inside the rooms. Uh, and then when they went out, finally after feminism, and so I went through all the readings, uh, the writings that they left about uh, taking back the roads. Uh, they do it not in a straight motion like the men would do, but in a circular motion. So they have these amazing. Um, Giro Tondi, and I found some testimonies of these women saying we were free, we were experiencing freedom in a round circle, and it became mm -hmm. almost uh, uh, a crazy moment. We went, went out of our head with freedom. We were inebriated with freedom and started to circle around. Um, so this is the discipline of soma aesthetics. It's how the soma, how the body uh, experiences uh, space around it and experience. Um, life and events. This is another um, topic instead, migration and music. Um, it came out in the California Italian Studies journal, Italian Tango between Buenos Aires and Paolo Ponte. Uh, there was not uh, never a very clear explanation of how Italians played into the, um, the tango, but they were there. They were there. They were the first ones. Um, it was a melting pot. Buenos Aires, where tango was born, was really a melting pot. So one of the strands was also the Italian uh, strand. <laughs> La Guardia Vieja uh, was led by two Italians, Roberto Firpo, a pianist, uh, who was the son of an Italian grocer in Buenos Aires, and Francisco Canaro. Uh, the Vanguardia was embodied by another Italian, Astor Piazzolla. So I went through that. And also um, the bars, the cafes where tango was played, were all Italian joints. They all have Italian names. Mm -hmm. uh, Salone Perracca, Guarda e Passa, Lago di Como, Patria Lavoro. Mm -hmm. The language, there is a lot of Cocolice language, this hybrid uh, uh, Spanish-Italian uh, dialect language uh, that comes into the tangos, and the lyrics. So for example, the lyrics over there, the Canzonetta 1951, Quando escucho sole mio, senza mamma e senza amore, siento un frío acá en el core. 
um, Kime Yena La Ciudad. I don't know Spanish, I don't know how to pronounce well Spanish, but you see how uh, the lyrics speak about Italians and uh, use Italian language in it. And then I uh, finished this article with Paolo Conte and his uh, tangos. Uh, he's been called the Bignami of Argentinian tango because he uh, yeah. wrote a lot of it, it tango music, like an entire album yeah. on tango. Um, it's always been with music. Uh, the, um, this is an explanation of how I teach this course, uh, Italy through in lyrics, the melody of Italy using music to teach Italian history and culture. Um, because I believe that really if there is a way, anything that allows us to penetrate deep inside any national culture and to recognize its essence, it's the ability to recognize and situate its music. So when you watch a movie and you hear one important song that for us means a lot, Bandiera Rossa, Bella Ciao, uh, you understand what the meaning behind it is. Um, so this is an article that came out in uh, Italica. And it's related to the book manuscript that I have on this topic, uh, which is too long to be published anywhere. So we'll see what we do. Um, music and feminism, this is the struggle of Venetian women from, I studied uh, their trajectory, song trajectory, the songs by fighting women, the Venetian experience, from the songs of the beat makers, uh, that was a very um, common work of arti artisanal work in Venice, they were beat makers, they had their own songs, and some songs were very um, protesting against their own exploitation, and they were using their needles to punch people uh, in their song, in their lyrics. To tobacco factory workers, uh, the, the strikes of the tobacco factories, they also had their songs. To feminist yeah. choirs and today's activism, uh, um, I go to today and how um, the, the salary, the committee for the salary for women, for working women at home, created two albums of songs that gave voice to their fight. And now there are protests um, led in Venice by women that use songs to keep the water public, for example, or to create uh, a choir of uh, multi-ethnic people, so to create community. Um, this is cinema instead, and it's the history of Passanante through the metaphor of Antigone. Uh, Passanante is an incredible story. I, I advise you to watch this movie, um, very effective. Uh, it's a story of uh, an anarchist who attempted to kill Umberto I, the king of Italy, and failed because he had this little um, knife that wouldn't have been able to kill anybody. But he was terribly treated. He went out of, um, of his mind inside uh, the tower of um, Elba, the island of Elba, underwater. Um, and it, the whole town was punished by changing the name from, Savo uh, from Salvia di Lucania to Savoia di Lucania. So they punished them by giving them the name of the, of the king. And um, there was a, a movement to put his brain, because after, even after he died, they used his brain in the Museum of um, Crime in Rome. So there was a whole movement to put the museum, ba the brain back with the body and bury it. So using the um, metaphor of Antigone and the piety towards the dead. So that was interesting. Cinema and philosophy, this was the uh, documentaries by Andrea Segre and the philosophy of Emmanuel Levinas, and the idea that when you look at the other, you're actually building yourself uh, through the face, the image of the face. Uh, Levinas' philosophy says, the inevitable responsibility to which the other, as a face, summons the same. So that movies by Se Sege always point, use these images of um, uh, close-ups of visage, of uh, uh, faces looking out and looking out in a very serious way that summons the other, the watcher, the viewer to responsibility. So I found that it was very um, apt to use uh, Levinas' philosophy to criticize them. Um, okay, I'm done with the uh, content. Now I tell you what I can do. I do with research by uh, helping my colleagues. So here I added to the last four issues of the American Association of Teachers of Italian online working papers. There was a lot of uh, 
papers that I read and uh, published online, uh, and that was the Italian American Studies Association conference editing um, that I co-edited with Ala Gravano. So we worked on um, doing research and service for our colleagues. To the students, these are the three um, symposia, symposia that I uh, organized in uh, Boca Raton at my university where I have Italy in transit, but I have students present their research. So it actually ties with my research because they're my students and they take writer's classes with me. But I asked them, who would you like to invite here that could work with you in your topic or maybe in the future? And then we call them and say, can you please come without any money? And, <laughs> and we have these beautiful conferences though that uh, become really important also because we have colleagues from all around that come and it's a nice meeting. Uh, moment for us, and it's very tied to my research, Italy in transit, how, tr how Italy is changing, uh, with new Italians in Italy, with Italians living abroad, and Italian Americans. Uh, these are products of the students that came out of my classes, um, graduate in involvement in research. Uh, we studied uh, oral history archive of uh, Italian Americans living in Florida. So we have uh, Vincenzo Zarilli, he's there, you, you know him. Uh, I have here a friend from Florida, so he knows the, what I'm talking about. And we interviewed him, and now he's housed the, in the archive of the, of the library. So this is something that we're doing that involves the research. Also, they built a whole site that's called Italian American Memoirs Documentary Archive where we had people, undergraduate students, graduate students work on a fund of letters that were sent to us from World War II, uh, from Portland, Oregon, uh, the Badia Johnson Archive. We worked together with the Honor Italian Honor Society. We worked uh, as a group. And then the graduate students um, put it in, um, in the archive. I'm very proud of this. Please go visit it. Um, they did a wonderful job with the letters, with the postcards, and also with the uh, interviews that are linked, the oral history. And finally, this is the last step, and it involves undergraduate students, and uh, I try to involve them in my research, and um, in, in exchange, they help me. So uh, when we go to Venice, the university uh, gives this the SURF fellowship, the, Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship, and we won it with uh, Nicole last year. So we were studying the language borrowing, the loan words in the Italian language, and their effect on Italian uh, culture in the case of Venice. So to see if this Venice that has been assaulted everywhere is also losing its language uh, by starting to adopt all these Italian English terms in it and maybe forgot, forgetting its dialect. And, uh, and the dialect, as we all know, keeps really the, the soul, the underskin, says Manigello, of, uh, of our culture. So this is the last, I oh no, one more. Um, I was speaking this morning about this painter uh, who is Tom Di Salvo, and over there you see this big painting that he donated. This is where from research, from using the work of Tom Di Salvo in class with my students, we were able to do community outreach because we had a big um, endowment through for his memory um, and uh, presented him at the, his work at the symposium that you see down below. So Tom Di Salvo and his Italian American paintings would be one of the examples of how community outreach students, my own Italian American research, uh, come together. Thank you. <laughs> we have some time for a question and answer. And, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't very deep in any one of these things. It's really one time everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. Uh, why don't you call on um, whoever raised your hand? And, uh, okay, do, do you have a question? <laughs> I call the people? No. <laughs> Any questions, anybody? Um, I was just interested in that student research project you just talked about. And what, what did you and the student find about American language or English language infiltrating? We found that uh, uh, Venetians who work with tourists are more than happy to use uh, Venetian uh, American words and English words. For example, in Venice, now there is a shot. 
shot, we never had it, but because of all the students who come there, we don't have shots. We don't have to use to, to drink like this. We drink very slowly. Except for espresso. So, uh, except for espresso. Shot of espresso, but we just for shot, right? So now that's yeah, one yeah. word that's geared to them, and it's made to, um, yeah, to sell, to sell more. But there are some, there is resistance, and that is interesting. That was the part that interested us more. Uh, there is this group called the Antiki. They want to revive the ancient Compagnia de la Calza, the stockings company. They were the ones that would do all the festivities for the Republic in the time of the Republic. And they try to revive that type of company where they use dialect in their plays, in their um, meetings. And they say, because dialect is us, and we don't want to, re to forget it. Mm -hmm. And from that group came out a nice play that we are. Ah, perfect providence that we were there so we went and watched uh, where there is this uh, mayor who wants to sell Venice to the tourists so he uses all this language come to Disneyland it's Venice land it's a, a place where you can have fun and then there is um, the, the boat driver that takes advantage of it and then there is somebody who wants instead to keep the dialect and his language and keeps on speaking on stage in dialect and then there is the the um, spirit of Venice that hovers and then uh, leaves the way at the end of the play. So it was very nice that we had this perfect coincidental piece of uh, text that we could use.